the question I will be asking today is, are plastics sustainable? Can they be sustainable? And we'll go through this story and try to figure out, are they sustainable already? And what the future will bring in this area? Uh, this presentation and, and also my presence here is sponsored through the, uh, a project that we have that's funded by the European uh, Regional Development Fund. So that's why you will see a logo of our uh, project and also the European logo all along the presentation. Okay. So to start with, I see plastics as some sort of an unwanted friend. I hope you understand what I, I mean. Uh, we probably all have friends that, you know, we know they're good friends, but sometimes we're not very proud of them. We kind of hide them. We, but we always come back to them, and they're actually good friends, and they stay with us for decades and all the time. And plastics are something similar. It's, it's a, a little bit of a love-hate relationship with plastics. And uh, I find that very interesting, in fact. Uh, plastics, altogether, are a very large group of materials. You have researched polymers and plastics. You probably know that by now. And also, plastics have a very wide use. We find them everywhere. And as well, there's a great growth in their use. Um, but as I said, we have a bit of a ambivalent relationship, sort of a love-hate relationship with these materials. And the question always is, are plastics actually good or are they bad? We're, not, we're never quite sure. We, see, we hear all sorts of information, and it's very difficult to answer uh, to all of the questions. A key question is, are plastics safe? We want to be safe. That's, that's probably the first and most important thing. But then the second one, is do they harm health and the environment? What kind of an effect do they have? We use them every day, so we always feel very close to them and we ask these things. And uh, uh, information that we get goes in both direction. And it's also a question, how should we go forward? We see from year to year that we have more plastics around us. We find them in more applications. So where is this going? Will everything be plastic very soon? Is, is that a sensible future for us? So the goal of my presentation is really uh, to show how plastics are or can be sustainable or can become sustainable. Okay, so let's use this. Okay. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is the difference between polymer and plastics. We always talk about polymers, plastics, uh, people that don't have a lot of background in chemistry already get lost uh, at the term of polymer. They, they don't understand what that is anymore. But a polymer, in my opinion, or according to my definition, is some sort of a pure chemical substance. It has high molar mass, and it's composed from uh, repeating units, monomers. And it's some sort of uh, structure that we can symbolize with a pearl necklace with every pearl being one monomer. So it's a, a linear, long, huge molecule uh, with repeating units. We find polymers in ourselves. We're made of polymers, pretty much. We're made of proteins, mainly. We have fats. We have uh, DNA, which is also a, a polymer, which is crucial to our life. But when we look at plastics, what are plastics? Plastics are a material. That's a material that we can take, put into a machine, and make products from. So that's the difference between a polymer and a plastic. It's true that the main component of a plastic is a polymer, or several polymers mixed together. But it's a formulated material. It's prepared for use. It might have pigments, lubricants, antioxidants, fillers, all sorts of things added. And this is a material you put in the machine and you make, I don't know, Legos, for example. So a pure substance and a material, OK? Just so that you know we have this clear from the start. I'd like to start from uh, the history. So when people started using all sorts of materials, at first, of course, they had 
natural materials available. Natural materials are beautiful, they are, they're elegant, they're great. We have wood, we have stone, we have leather, we have feathers, we have bones. We have all sorts of things. But we're kind of limited, let's say, with the properties of these materials, with their availability. If we want to make things from bones, then you have to kill something to get the bones. And then if you use a lot of that stuff, you have to kill a lot of somebody's to get the bones. So that's a little bit of a problem. And then also the processability. How can you make certain forms from natural materials? You normally can't mold them. You, you can't form, let's say, wood into all sorts of forms. Or if you do, it might take a long time and a lot of experience and skill to do so. It becomes very expensive. So let's say I always say, imagine how you could make a car, like we use an automobile, from natural materials. You can make it. They've made it long ago. But it was very expensive. And part of the reason is, that they didn't have plastics at that point. Plastics are quite different from this. They have good properties, they're available, and processing is extremely easy and cheap. So with these limitations, they were searching for new materials that would be simple for processing, have good properties, and be cheap. And that's actually what plastics are. So they were working with all sorts of combination, mainly chemists, I would say. Uh, and we have, a f we have the first plastics made in about the middle of the 19th century. They were made on the basis of renewable resources because that's what they had. They worked with all these natural materials and they used them to transform them, change them to make a new material. They, they didn't know what they were making pretty much at that point, but they knew they needed new materials. So, the first plastic was based on cellulose, and uh, it had different names. The first, one, the first one that was really commercially successful came in around 1869, uh, produced by Hyatt. This is celluloid. This is uh, nitrocellulose. And it's interesting uh, why they decided to make this, why they were trying to make it. And I have a picture of an elephant here. The elephant here is not just for entertainment. Because they had a problem. Billiards, so playing pool, you know, billiards, was very popular at that time. And you use billiard balls, of course, and they figured out that if you want to make all the balls for all the people to play this popular game, you have to pretty much kill all the elephants to get uh, 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 the material, because you got it from the, from the um, tusks of the elephants. So they needed a replacement. They were looking for a replacement. There was a, an award offered for the person who can make a good replacement for natural, uh, 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 how's it called? Ivory. ivory, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, ivory. <laughs> so right from the start, actually, plastics were trying to solve uh, a problem of non-sustainability. It's, it's actually very interesting that we're coming back to that. And nitrocellulose was the first one that could actually do this. So if we uh, continue here, as I said, they were using natural raw materials to start. Protein, cellulose, oils, and so on. Why were they doing that? Because petrochemical industry didn't exist yet. That was just starting right at the same time. Early 19th century, petrochemical industry started. And uh, you would have, for example, kerosene. In 1840, that was, that was the use of oil. Kerosene for lamps. That was it. They didn't see it as a chemical yet, as a raw material that they could make something from. So they didn't use it. They didn't know how to use it, actually. But as they were doing all uh, this work, all this development, slowly also understanding came. Slowly, I would say. because. We have a, a, a key time when Staudinger, Hermann Staudinger, in 1920, for which he received the Nobel Prize in the 50s, figured out that polymers, in fact, are macromolecules, that these are linear, huge molecules. 
so it's a substance of high molar mass composed of repeating units. This was something unheard of. This was, this was a crazy idea. And it took decades, in fact, that it was finally accepted. And we're talking about 1920 here. You know, this is, this is very late. We have to understand when plastics actually came around. They're not known for very long. And if we look at polyethylene, well, a Y should be here. Uh, the material all the bags are made from, and it's uh, the most popular plastic used in the world in millions of tons. This was a chance discovery at the end of the uh, 19th century. And then in 1933, so again, not that long ago, they figured out how to make it from ethylene at high pressure. It took a few more years so they could repeat this experiment. So we're not talking about production yet. But production came just at the start of the, or just before the Second World War for military use. And in 53, 1953, there was a breakthrough with new catalysts that allowed the production of polyethylene at uh, low pressures. This is the structure of polyethylene. It's extremely simple. It's just CH2, CH2 all along. Now, for example, we have ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. This is a more recent development, not, not very recent, but you know, several decades ago. This is uh, a special type of polyethylene that has really good properties. It can be used for um, safe, uh, bullet safe vests or for high uh, performance ropes, let's say for ships and so on. So polyethylene is not just a material to make bags from. It's very soft and you can pull it and so on, but can be a high performance material. So you can see how this development went. I would just uh, mention perhaps uh, some, some more uh, examples. We have nylon polyamides. First synthesis, 1935, again, before Second World War. If you look at fibers, prior to Second World War, 80% was cotton, 20% was wool. After the war, 25% artificial fibers, most of that nylon. This is what a difference actually plastics brought. We have polystyrene synthesized a little bit earlier, production again in the 30s, and you had expanded or foamed polystyrene, this is styrofoam, in 1949, okay? Not very long ago again. And you can see on this chart how the use of plastics grew. In 1950, this is 1.5 million tons, 1.5. This goes to 2008 right now, but I think uh, two th two in 2011, we used about 280 million tons of these materials, plastics altogether. Out of plastics, there are five commodity types of plastics, polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, PET, polyethylene in, in more varieties. And these materials represent 75% of these 280 million tons. We have many, many types of plastics and polymers, but 75%, only five types. Huge productions, okay? That's, that's what that means. Where do we use them? We use them everywhere. And it's not just the bag or the obvious thing that we see. It's everywhere. And it, it has a purpose. They're almost irreplaceable today because, you know, Regardless of what we might think of plastics, when we get hurt and we go to the emergency room and the doctor starts opening all sorts of packages, it's all sterile, single use, puts it in your arm, gives you this and that. When you're at the doctor's, look at what they have at the side. You'll see all these packages. It's all plastic. It's all throwaway. It's all safe. It's all sterile. It saves your health or it can save lives. So that's what plastics do in the car. When you crash it, let's say you park it too far into the garage, what's there to uh, save you? Airbags. What will you make airbags from? What? Plastics? It's almost, it's impossible to find another material. If you look at food safety, you can package food today. It's safe, so we can use it later. 
plastics. Entertainment as well, I mean, or fun. You know, I was skiing not long ago. Everything around me, all my equipment, all my clothes, it's all plastics. If you go windsurfing, we have people from Cyprus here, probably like that, or you go sailing, it's all plastics. Your sail is plastic, the boat is plastic, most of the uh, gear you have on yourself is plastic. And also, I have small children. I have to say, if it weren't for plastics, they would have a lot fewer toys, you know. <laughs> so we find them everywhere, and they make our, our life, in fact, easier, better. If we look at where plastics are used, this is a chart that shows that. Probably you can't see this very well, but the only thing I'd like to emphasize is that this part here, about 35%, I don't know where from which year this is, but this is an average number, 35% goes for packaging. 35% packaging. Packaging, we open the thing, we throw it away. Probably that same day. We don't keep it for very long. And that's actually very important. Uh, if you look at uh, the growth through the years, I like all these uh, charts. They're you know, different uses, I think, in, in uh, agriculture greenhouses, mulching film, and so on. But what I like here, going from uh, you know, 19, uh, what is it, 85 to 2004, you just have growth everywhere, growth, growth, growth. If you look at different regions of the world, world, Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, different parts of Europe, USA, Japan, so on. Growth, growth, growth from year to year. This continues. This is going on for decades already, and it's still continuing. What will, go in, what will be going on in the future? Plastics are entering new applications where you used to use, let's say, metals. You didn't have an opportunity to use something else. Metals, let's say, within or around the car engine. You can now use plastics. You can use nylons that are filled, high performance, and so on. And it's, again, cheaper to produce. We find polymers and plastics in medicine and electronics, all sorts of technology, energy, construction. And the interesting thing is, because we're all trying to be very green, very environmental, sustainable, and so on. Most of these technologies are actually made possible by plastics. If you want to make huge wind turbines, well, what will you make them from? You'll make them from plastic composite or polymer composite, if you wish. You know, there's, there's nothing else. Let's say here, I'm showing a, a cover of a magazine. It says, plastics are route to fuel economy in cars. So if you want to make the cars better in fuel economy, you will use more plastics. So I, I am convinced that plastics are in our future, and we will use more of them. They will be better. And there's nothing we can do about that. But as with everything, I think we have always two sides of the story. So I've told you the great success, the uses, and you probably know that as well. But there's probably another side as well, the unsustainable side. So just to, to first go through the sustainability points, plastics make, let's say, heating more efficient through insulation. They lower mass, which Let's say if you use uh, plastic bottles instead of glass bottles, you will have fewer, let's say, or, or less use of energy for transport. Let's say you improve vehicles, as I've shown. Not necessarily like this, but good example. Uh, you will have less food waste in countries or in regions of the world where you don't have, let's say, good packaging available and roots to deal with food, most of the food gets thrown away because it goes bad, it spoils. With plastics, you can prevent that if you package it properly and the right time. And investment in agriculture to produce food is enormous. So if actually plastics, some foils, bags, allow you to make those savings, these are huge savings, and that's what plastics actually do. And in production of green energy, I already mentioned, you can have flexible solar uh, cells. And also, you can replace materials that are more burdening to the environment. 
Uh, not that I want to go into the bag discussion, but you know, a, a paper bag has a bigger environmental footprint and burden than a plastic bag. So there is a saving there. How can you be sustainable? Well, you can raise sustainability through better use and, and sensible use. You have to be efficient in the use of the material. We have products that are exactly the same, but I found them in the store. I check these things as it's a bit of a hobby for me. And you can find, let's say, packaging bottles that differ in weight by 30%. It's the same material, same volume, same kind of product, 30%. That's where you can save. So regardless of you know, what type of plastic we're talking about, if you're just efficient in the use of the material, you, there's a saving. If you reuse, let's say, you have a bag and you don't take a new bag every time you go to the store, you just use the same bag six times, you know, that's 600% improvement of the utilization and five bags less used. This adds up nicely. We can recycle. Recycling is the most efficient reuse of plastic waste. It saves the most uh, that we've invested in terms of energy and resources in the material. And finally, once we have uh, a waste that we can't do much with, we can use the energy. We can burn it. It's, it's not a sin to burn plastic because plastics are made from fossil resources. And, you know, we, we burn directly just to heat, to get energy, uh, to drive around, travel, and so on, about 95% of oil. And we don't have a big problem with it when we put it in the car. So burning a plastic bag or a piece of packaging or any plastic is not that bad, as long as we take care of the emissions, OK? As long as we do that. The, uh, However, still, although I'm an enthusiast for plastics, please don't use plastics if you don't need to. Just don't use them. Use the more sustainable route. Have a, have a glass pitcher, have a, have a mug, have a basket for all I care, have a, have a fountain pen instead of I don't know how many uh, ballpoint pens, have a pencil that's made from wood. You will still use a lot of plastics. You will not become the Flintstones if you do that, you know? But your, your uh, footprint will be smaller. But we all know that plastics are bad. They're, they have a bad reputation. Are plastics good? If, when you ask people, they're bad. They're bad. We all use them. So what is, what is the cause of that? Plastics are, for example, increasingly banned. There are bans for plastics, let's say, in many countries, particularly uh, bags are, are hated a lot, and you have countries where they're banned. Let's say in Africa or Asia, there are countries where the plastic bag is banned completely. So what's the problem? So yes, they are bad, and they have two problems. The first is pollution with plastic waste. Because of this great growth in use, despite all the recycling, collection, and so on, plastics get into the environment. And they have no place in the environment. The environment actually doesn't know what to do with it. Nature doesn't know how to deal with these artificial materials. And the second point is that they're based on non-renewable resources, fossil resources. And this is inherently unsustainable. And we'll look at these two points now. So first of all, waste. Plastics are durable. They've been made to be durable. They've been made that way intentionally. So when they get into the environment, they don't degrade. They just stay there. They travel around. They fall to, into small pieces. But they don't go away for a very long time. And I'm not going to say how long, because that depends on where they are. If they're in the sun, if they're underground, in the water, what type, and so on. But it's safe to say that compared with our lives, well, they're durable. They're not going anywhere in, in let's say, a few decades. You probably all have cleaned, I don't know, a, a cellar uh, where you found, let's say, at your grandmother's. And there was a plastic bag that's decades old, and it's still there. And it hasn't fallen apart. And it still actually holds the stuff you put, it, you put in. You know, It doesn't go anywhere. And the same happens in nature. These materials will be there for decades. 
And if we put them there, we allow them to go there, they'll stay there. So we can see pictures of how plastics harm, let's say, marine animals. Plastics can travel around the water very easily. And this is, in fact, a problem. And it's not so far from us that one might think. This is not only in the Pacific Ocean that it's a problem. It's a problem everywhere. We have microplastics, for example, in the Adriatic Sea. You don't see it when you go around. But once you start looking for it, you find it everywhere. How, how do these materials get into the environment? Well, sometimes we have bad waste management. But we can also, for example, just wash our great sports clothes, our fleeces, and so on. Every time you do that, fibers go into the environment. If you want to check, check it. Filter the water that goes out of your washing machine, and you will see fibers. Fibers made of, for example, PET. That doesn't degrade. If you have bad composting, for example, bad material going into composting that contains plastics and it's not properly then sieved and so on, you can get pieces of plastic. This is, for example, a piece of plastic. Maybe it's not very visible right now. And once you put this in the field somewhere, yep, you put plastics in the environment again. And this is a little experiment we're doing uh, that we don't know the outcome anymore. We're just putting plastics into the environment, and we're not sure what will happen from this. There are many implications what can happen. It can go into the food chain. Plastics are mainly hydrophobic, so they can act as carriers for persistent organic pollutants. And these things we're just discovering right now. We don't have a lot of evidence. We don't have a lot of information. But we're, we're actually discovering this. Nobody was thinking about you know, fibers going from washing machines before. But once you start looking, hmm, is this good? I don't know. I don't think so. And the other point is that they're based on fossil resources. So we have something at the start of the life of plastics and at the end when they become waste. Why is it bad to use fossil resources? They're natural. It's perfectly fine. Uh, we can use them very efficiently and so on. But we have a bit of a problem. It's a kinetic problem. Once you use crude oil or natural gas and you make plastics, you're really good at this now. And we use the plastics, and let's say we use them for a while. They become waste. Let's say we collect them, we incinerate them, we make CO2 out of the carbon and the plastic. And that can become biomass again. Plants take CO2. It's nice. So from biomass, then you could again come to your fossil resource. But as I said, it's a kinetic problem. Because to go from oil to your material, to waste, and then to incinerate it, it might take, I don't know, 10 years. It can take 100 years. I don't care. It can take 1,000 years, even if you wish. But to get from biomass to oil, it will take millions of years. So you have a cycle. It looks really nice. But it doesn't function. And we're just pumping carbon from here into here, possibly into here, into some waste that's lying around. So we're pumping it away from here. And that, that just is not good for the environment. I mean, we are improve, uh, growing the concentration of CO2 and so on, definitely. So it's a cycle that doesn't function. And here we're talking mainly about CO2. And this is an environmental aspect. We're increasing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, and that's not good for our planet. There's another point as well why fossil resources are questionable. What will the price of oil be in the future? You know? I have a chart here of two, two, uh, well, two representation of the price of oil. When this starts in like 1860 or 61, I think, something like that. And this goes to present day, so 2010. And when they discovered oil, they, you know, there were a few wells and so on. It was expensive, of course. Then it expanded. It became really cheap. Then we had the first oil crisis in the 1970s. Went up. And we're about here right now. We're, at, we're here, I think, at $95 per barrel. So in the future, Everybody is expecting that oil prices will go up. So that's an economic aspect. 
if oil prices are high, I don't know, maybe we won't be able to afford plastics. So this is an issue as well. So you have two uh, aspects of the story. Now, I'll switch over to bioplastics now, because bioplastics offer an answer to both of these challenges. Bioplastics, by the definition that I agree with and use, are biodegradable and or bio-based plastics. So they can be one or the other or both. Okay, so they can be biodegradable or bio-based or both. And please understand that biodegradable doesn't mean that it's bio-based. And if you have a bio-based plastic, it doesn't mean that it's biodegradable. Okay? You can make a biodegradable material from fossil resources. Or you can make a non-degradable material from renewable resources. There is no equality here. They're connected but not equal. So we can have a different source, renewable, which is biomass. There is nothing else renewable. Or non-renewable, fossil. And the material can be biodegradable or non-biodegradable. Okay. <clears throat> So if you look at biodegradable plastics first, these have the same functionality as artificial synthesized polymers, plastics. They undergo degradation under certain conditions, and they degrade to natural harmless substances. It's a CO2, water, biomass, nothing bad. And the degradation must include a biological step. That's why we call it biodegradation. Biodegradation means that microorganisms digest, they eat the biodegradable plastic. This is food for them. They find it somewhere lying and they go, oh, this, this is yummy, let's eat it. And why do they do that and not with the other plastic? Why do they do that with the biodegradable plastic? Well, because it's somehow similar to the food they're used to. It has a similar chemical structure, okay? So it actually makes sense to use natural or building blocks that are similar to natural structures. Let's say sugars, proteins, and so on. Okay? And if we look by source how we can get biodegradable polymers, we can start from natural polymers like starch, collagen, uh, collagen uh, chitosan. We have modified natural polymers, viscose made from cellulose, let's say all all sorts of esters of cellulose, or we can have synthetic uh, polymers, like polylactic acid, polycoprolactone, and so on. These are some polyesters, okay? So if we look at, through a few of these cases, okay, the first one I'll, I'll show is thermoplastic starch. Starch in its uh, native form, let's say when you peel the potato, you know, when you help your mom, you will find some white dust at the bottom of the uh, water where you put the potato. That's starch. It's in granular form. It looks like dust, like a little sand. And starch has a granular form. This granular form, of course, is not useful to make plastic. So what you need to do, you need to plasticize it. And you heat it up, you mix it with plasticizers, which are nothing special. They can be water, glycols, glycerol, something like that. And you get a uh, a, a mass, a paste, which already starts behaving like a plastic. Now with some additions, you know, possibly blending it with slightly better polyesters, you can make a material that is pretty decent. And we can make, let's say, bags from it. Those are the bags that you use as liners for your organic waste collection. Or you find it as a styrofoam substitute in some packaging. The, the stuff that looks like styrofoam feels a little bit different. Uh, and you put it in the water, it dissolves. Or you can use this in colorful form as a toy. You've probably seen it. You, you make it wet and then it sticks together. That's uh, thermoplastic starch. It's biodegradable, it's bio-based. And here, we're taking a natural polymer, because starch is a natural polymer, it's a carbohydrate made of sugar, it's a uh, polysaccharide. We take this polymer structure and we don't destroy it, we just change it, okay? We keep the natural polymer, we change it, we blend it, and then we can use it, okay? So that's one approach. This is a commercial material and we all use it probably. I'll go to another one, polylactic acid. 
Or same thing, different name, polylactide. Okay, it's the same thing, not different. This is an aliphatic polyester, and we get it through a different route. Here we take, uh, let's say, starch, we hydrolyze it to get sugar, then we ferment it, like you're making ethanol, for example, by fermentation. But in this case, we make lactic acid. Make lactic acid. So you go from a sugar through fermentation to lactic acid. Lactic acid is a totally normal substance, natural substance. We have it in our body. It, it, you know, uh, uh, we form it in our muscles when we do something physical, for example. So this is the monomer. So we make it from a, a natural renewable resource through a bio route. But from here on, then we start doing chemistry. This goes into normal chemistry like any industrial process. We make the uh, cyclic dimer. It's called the lact lactide. It's a dilactide. So that's where this lactide comes from. And this then can be polymerized into the polymer. OK? So we have a different route here. We take a sugar, we ferment it, get a monomer, and then we take chemistry to do uh, to make the polymer, and polylactic acid is not natural. You do not find polylactic acid anywhere in nature. Not natural at all. This is, uh, this is a, a commercial material. We have a little bit of, uh, you know, of chemical interest in it because it's, it has uh, a few stereoisomers, and if we use them in different combinations in the polymer, we can influence the properties of the polymer because of how mainly the, the polymer chains stack, okay? So this is a different kind. This is biodegradable and it's bio-based. Polyhydroxyalkanoates. These are very interesting little beasts. They're polyesters. This is a aliphatic natural polyester and it's a thermoplastic. Thermoplastic means that we can melt it and reform it, just like wax, for example, or like polyethylene. The interesting thing about polyhydroxyalkanoates is that they are bio, proper biopolymers. A biopolymer is a natural polymer, a natural macromolecule. And here I have pictures of, of microorganisms that produce polyhydroxyalkanoates. These are not genetically modified. They're natural. They make this polyester, just like, for example, plants make starch. It's a material and energy uh, uh, storage. That's why they make it. And of course, since they make it, they also know how to degrade it to get the material and the energy out again when they need it. So of course, by definition, it's biodegradable. So when they grow, if you feed them properly and keep them under the right conditions, they will make these blobs inside their uh, uh, cell. And this is actually the polyester. Most of the microorganism is, in fact, the polyester. So once the fermentation is this far, you kill them, you extract the polymer, and you get a material. It's a polyester, just like any, any polyester we synthesize. We have a number of uh, variants, what we can use as monomers. The most known is polyhydroxybutyrate, that's PHB normally, okay? Uh, whereas polyhydroxyalkanoates normally is PHA. This is a group name for all of these polyester options that we have. The production is currently based on, on sugars that are fermented. They're fed to the microorganisms that make the polyester. Okay, so we have a a uh, natural resource that we biologically transform into a biopolymer. You just need to then formulate this biopolymer and it's a useful material. It's a plastic, proper plastic. It doesn't have to depend only on, let's say, sugars, but we can also use waste materials such as whey from uh, cheese production, glycerol that's left over once you make biodiesel, uh, bone and meat meal, this is a good nitrogen source, Animal fats are being tested. So we're going in the direction of waste materials as the resource to use. We have a number of then synthetic polyesters made from fossil resources as well, or fossil mixed with bio-based resources, uh, monomers. Uh, they, they, can be, they can be either 
aliphatic polyesters, aliphatic aromatic polyesters, just the modification of PET, for example, can also be biodegradable. We have water-soluble polymers. These are all biodegradable that I'm listing here. So we have a number of these options, and we use them all. They have different properties. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail. But what is biodegradation? What is it? Degradation, number one, must be complete. And it, it's, it's a result of abiotic and biotic factors. So you can have sunlight, for example, UV influencing the fragmentation and so on. But it always goes in two stages. First, you have a fragmentation. You have the polymer structure actually degraded down to oligomers. You see it outside on the macroscopic world by the fact that this material becomes brittle and falls apart, okay? And then the second stage you always have to have is mineralization. Mineralization because you turn organic carbon into inorganic carbon, okay? That's why. Uh, and this is digestion by microorganisms. They eat this material. There are many roots, many enzymes that help and you know, can, can influence this, but mainly there are just two mechanisms. You should understand that. There's hydrolysis and there's oxidation, and there's nothing else. That's it. But you can have different enzymes, different conditions, different susceptibilities, and so on. Uh, so this is just showing the fragmentation part. Here you can use light, water, heat, oxygen, stress, and so on. So you get to smaller particles, and the, then the microorganism, this little Pac-Man, can eat it, digest it, and you get to CO2, let's say if you're in uh, aerobic uh, conditions. Well, oh, this state here, I didn't, I didn't want to keep that there, but okay. How do we measure this? Because we can't see this. It's very difficult to measure. Well, degradation is a question of rate. You know, everything will degrade in time, so we have to define the conditions and the limits in which biodegradation should occur. And we do this in standards. And also, we should understand that an unchanged natural material is biodegradable by definition. That's what's used also when you certify the materials. And the basic principle is like with our food, like this little boy is eating. You eat it, you convert it into CO2 if you're in aerobic conditions. And that's what the measurement is based on. You look at the conversion of carbon in the polymer into CO2. And if you have time and conversion, for example, this is uh, such a plot that shows this conversion. It's called respirometry. You have a closed system and you measure how much CO2 is generated and, and uh, produced by these microorganisms. In this case, for example, you get to uh, 65 degrees. So depending on under which standard you're working, this could be biodegradable or could not be. Okay, by, by the European, so EN standard, for compostable plastic, this is not biodegradable. It has to be 90, 90%, and that's part of that that I said, it has to fully degrade. It can't just degrade a little bit, you know. You mix polypropylene and a little bit of starch, and it falls apart and you say, oh, UPD, this is biodegradable, because the starch was eaten. eaten. That's not enough. It has to go all the way. Oops, uh, the standards that are established uh, deal with different kinds of biodegradability. It can be anaerobic, it can be aerobic, it can be in soil, in water. The most important is composting. That's what most of the standards and certificates are uh, based on, composting. You look at toxicity and so on. So this is a very detailed thing. I won't go into it. But we have, on the basis of standards, which are just rules and procedures, uh, certificates. And certificates are something that uh, give a guarantee to the consumer that a material, for example, is okay for home composting. This is for, this is a label of a certificate for home composting. If you see this label on, let's say, a piece of packaging, this mean that it means that it's certified according to a standard, that somebody tested it, and they can use this label only if they have the certificate. So you know that this is okay to put in your home compost. And there are several examples of these uh, 
labels. This is compostable, it means for industrial composting, because if you say compostable just like that, that refers to industrial composting. In industrial composting, you have higher temperatures, up to 70, between 50 and 70 degrees, whereas in home composting, you will have lower temperatures. That's why there's a difference, okay? Uh, so please always look at the labels. Labels mean that you have a guarantee that the material is in fact suitable for one or the other type of biodegradability. Okay, let's look at the bio-based plastics. Okay, I've already explained this to you. Uh, and we want to be here CO2 ne neutral. That's why we want to do bio-based plastics because we get out of this conundrum only by sticking within this cycle, you go from CO2 to biomass and then plastics, and then you're, you're in real time. You don't have a problem anymore, like with oil. That's why this is considered to be sustainable and using fossil sources is not. As I said, bio-based plastics are not always biodegradable, okay? Not the same. And the approach here is that we make building blocks or even basic chemicals from bioresources. That's, that's the basic approach that we have. And we replace the same or similar chemicals that are made from fossil sources in a production of plastic. We can use fermentation, so we can bioconvert the biomass, or we can do it chemically, just by any means that we have. And something that's coming up are biorefineries, and I'll mention that a little bit later. So historically, I already uh, mentioned you know, what the bio-based plastics are like. I spoke about nitrocellulose and the balls, but then we used, for example, proteins, casein. Uh, nylon 11 is still made from castor oil or undecanoic acid that we get from castor oil. Why? Well, because this is a convenient resource. It's easier to get to undecanoic acid from castor oil than to synthesize it from anything that we might have. And this is not something new, you see? So bio-based plastics are not new. In 1940s, you know, Henry Ford was uh, showing with a hammer how good his uh, soy-based phenolic plastic was from which he made the hood on this car. This is not something new. We're reinventing it. But on the other hand, the driver that we have now is the environmental aspect. That's new. It used to be you know, the only resource, then it was a convenient resource, but now we have the environmental driver. That makes a difference. And if we look at renewable resources, all that I've mentioned right now, uh, up until now, pretty much were you know, sugar, oils, protein, and so on. Well, what are those? They're, those are actually food and feed sources. So that's what we use currently. And that's actually a short-term solution because we need food to eat. There are more people, we need food. So at the time when the production of bio-based plastics is low, we can do this. But if we want to grow this production, like you know, we see growth in all types of plastics, then this just won't work anymore. So we'll move to the second generation of bioresources to be used. And these are non-food and waste resources, like wood, straw, or waste. Okay, so there's a lot of work being done on this. And then for third generation, we're counting on microorganisms, sort of like, like the biofuel story goes, you know, from food to, let's say, wood to microorganisms. And here we can look at algae, even genetically modified organisms, but I'm not going to go into that discussion. The basic thing, however, is that it's all from CO2 and water. And that's actually what we should uh, keep in mind. If we look at a, an example, biopolyethylene. We can make polyethylene from bio-based resources completely, 100%. How do we do that? Well, we take sugar from sugar cane, ferment it to ethanol, then you dehydrate it to get ethylene, which is misspelled here, and it's then polymerized in the normal way to polyethylene. Okay, this is this is 100% bio-based. It's indistinguishable from normal polyethylene made from oil. You can't take, tell it apart. It's chemically the same, exactly the same. Okay? Well, not exactly. We'll get to that point. It's made commercially. 
We have questions here. How efficient is the ethanol fermentation? Hmm, I don't know. We lose some carbon as we ferment. So we're getting into this question. Let's say if you use sugars to make polyhydroxyalkanoates, it's much more efficient. You don't have the loss of carbon. So these are still steps uh, to look at. I will uh, show you bio-PET. PET is the material for all these bottles that you have on your uh, tables. Beautiful material. Excellent, but it's starting to become bio. How is it bio? PET is made from ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid. This is a polyester, it's aromatic. And now ethylene glycol has been replaced by a biosourced ethylene glycol. So we can get to 30% biocarbon content in the polyethylene terephthalate bottle. This is on the market. It's marketed as a plant bottle. It's used by Coca-Cola and Heinz. I have this little mark here, 30% bio. Okay, is that enough? We want, we'd like 100% for everything. Well, we're going towards 100%. Terephthalic acid, this is an aromatic structure. It's a diacid, aromatic diacid, is now also being produced, this is in development, but very late stage of development, the production of terephthalic acid from biomass. This is through a, a well, proprietary uh, procedure with catalysts and so on. But you get to aromatics, benzene, toluene, xylene. That's what they always refer to. And now if we can make terephthalic acid, which will give us 100% bio, bio-based PET. Well, we can also do other things. We can go into polystyrene, we can go to, to uh, polyamides, polycarbonates, polyurethanes, and so on. So I hope you see what's coming. Mm -hmm. This is developed. Now, once this is developed, and perhaps with a little bit of price fluctuation, we're gonna have more and more bio-based plastics that we know today already. They'll just be replaced. And they won't be different at all. So you'll have the same plastics, but from a different source. It's not only the same plastics, it's also new ones. For example, I have a, a case here uh, developed by Roquette in France on isosorbide, which goes from starch glucose sorbitol to isosorbide. What is it? It's a diol. It's a cyclic diol like this. It's kind of an interesting structure. But what can you make from it? You can make all sorts of carbonates. You can make a carbonate. You can make a polyurethane if you wish. You can make uh, something similar to PET, where you use the isosorbite as the diol. So it's a polyester, and it's a very good polyester, in fact. Uh, you can make different polyesters, also 100% bio-based. What is this showing here? This is actually uh, an analysis of the CO2 footprint. And what it's showing here is that the product made from isosorbide actually has a smaller footprint. And that CO2 footprint. And that's actually at the core of why we're doing this. I told you, two drivers. One is environmental, and that's that. And the other one is economic. If oil prices go really up, then we have an alternative. And this material, for example, isosorbide, is produced, you know, uh, in what? In a biorefinery. Now that's something new. A biorefinery, this, is, this stands in, in France, uses bio-based raw materials, puts them in a refining process, which is really equivalent to a normal refinery based on oil, and they make all sorts of products. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they make food, materials, chemicals, all sorts of stuff. The interesting thing is, the, the most interesting thing is here that they have two raw materials, and they make 700 products. 7,000 tons per day. No, well, I don't, I'm not sure if this is going to be 7,000 tons per day, but I think that's a mistake. But still, 700 products, and this is the biorefinery. OK, so this is the future that's already arrived. This, in fact, this, in fact, is a green industrial revolution that is taking place right now here. And you have the opportunity, in fact, to be part of this. What we're doing is we're preparing to have an alternative to oil, okay? And that's in the back of all the bioplastics and so on. There are a number of bio-based monomers that we can use in the production of plastics. I'm not going to go 
through all of them because I, I think it's not that interesting. Now we have these plastics. Let's say I said polyethylene from bio-based resources is the same as the other polyethylene. How do we distinguish them? It's a very simple method. It's like carbon dating. We look at C14 content, the concentration of C14. Everything living, including you and me, we have carbon-14 in you know, our body and, and every carbon-containing component of our body. Where do we get it? We get it from the environment because it's created all the time. There is a constant concentration, and we, we inhale it, we eat it with our food, and we have it. Once we die, we stop getting it into our body, and it starts decaying. The half-time for this isotope is 5,000 uh, uh, 700 years. Actually, I forgot to change this. Uh, so, if you look at fossil resources, they've been in the, in the Earth for a very long time. And in 50,000 years, the C14 concentration from anything that dies, let's say a, a piece of wood, becomes really low, so you can't even detect it. It's negligible. Oil, is much older than this. So it means when you have a fossil resource, it does not have C14. So if you analyze polyethylene and it doesn't have C14, even if somebody says this is bio-based, you know it's not. And you can measure exactly the amount of carbon that is bio-based in your material. And that is, in fact, the basis for uh, standardization and certification. You can analyze it, you get a bio-based carbon content, it's between zero and 100, of course, there's no pass-fail mechanism, this is just what the number is. And we have certification on it and logos again. And the logos here, this is uh, from Dean Sertko, has the percentage here, bio-based 20 to 50%, 50 to 85, over 85, or Vinco, this is a Belgian certification scheme, shows it with these little stars which means, uh, I think, 20, 40, 60, 80, and more, I think, percent. Okay, so when you see these, that's what it means. And that's how we can always figure out if it is bio-based, really, even if it's indistinguishable uh, otherwise. So, the advantage of, advantages of bioplastics, what do they bring? In production, so when we create them, we can use renewable resources, and we're going towards CO2 neutrality. We reduce the CO2 footprint. After use, once we have the waste, we have an option to bioconvert it back into natural products. And what we can do, we can make plastics be a part of the natural material cycling. That's what we actually are doing by using these two options. We have nature, and from nature we can make the plastic, and then it comes back in if it biodegrades. And this is sort of like a leaf that grows on the tree, from bioresources, then falls down, decays, degrades, goes back into the soil, and can be recycled. So plastics, completely artificial materials that serve us really nicely, can get the same role as a completely normal leaf. And that's something really new. I would just say one thing uh, here, biodegradable versus bio-based. What do we want to use and why should we use it when? I, I see a lot of products like this that are made from biodegradable materials, and that's really nice. I like it a lot. Most of the biodegradable materials are bio-based, but some are not. So what is the function of this? Let's say a mouse you know, or, or a car seat. Will this go into composting so it will actually you know, do the function that it's made for? I don't think so. You know, For example, this, this is full of electronics, there's a chip, there's a wire, there are all sorts of stuff, and some biodegradable plastic. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. This will not go into composting. So, in some cases, I don't think biodegradable actually makes a lot of sense. Unless we can make it equally efficiently as the other plastics. But if we make things from bio-based plastics, that always brings us an advantage, because we're in that sustainable cycle. So keep that in mind, and we'll see what the future brings, but at the moment it's like that. I think, and I hope, that I've shown you that plastics can have a sustainable contribution 
to a higher sustainability. They already do, and they will even more so in the future. And I think this unwanted friend is, in fact, really a good friend. We shouldn't neglect, and uh, he's a, he, she is our partner for the future. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>